This is CBN News Watch. It is Tuesday, October 27th. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, just one week to go before Election Day, we're going to hear what voters are saying the state they, that could decide the winner, Pennsylvania. Coronavirus cases surging yet again, but the death rate is down. We're going to talk to CBN News reporter Lori Johnson about what we can expect in the days ahead. With Halloween just around the corner, an investigative journalist tells CBN News what he learned as he looked into the reality of the dark side of the supernatural. And President Donald Trump talking about his own faith and thanking God for his recovery and his wife from the coronavirus. All those stories and more are ahead in this edition of CBN Newswatch. I want to begin this half hour with the race to the White House with Election Day now exactly one week away. And many analysts believe the key state in the race could be Pennsylvania. Jenna Browder traveled to the Keystone State to get a sense of what voters there are saying. Erie County is one of a handful of swing counties in battleground Pennsylvania. Traditionally a blue county, home to many hardworking blue-collar Americans. It flipped red for Donald Trump in 2016. And now in 2020, there's still support for him here on the ground. But there's also a lot of enthusiasm for Joe Biden. And that's something Hillary Clinton didn't have. I travel a little bit, so when I go to rural areas, I think I see more Trump signs when I'm in the city. It's more 50-50. And that's what we saw, too, on our Rust Belt road trip. In more rural Erie County, Trump pen signs dominate. But in downtown Erie, Biden-Harris signs fill the lawns. Well, I think the 2020 election contrasts sharply with what we saw going on in 2016 here in Erie County. Joseph Morris, head of the political science department at Mercyhurst University, says these signs indicate voter enthusiasm. In 2016, it was difficult to find a Hillary Clinton sign anywhere in the city. This year, there are Joe Biden signs everywhere. Historically, Erie County votes blue in local and national elections. I like to describe the people who live in Erie County as salt of the earth. Uh, these people are hardworking, a very proud people that unfortunately have been without jobs. Many of them have been without jobs for quite a while. And that's how Donald Trump flipped it to red in 2016, promising to bring back manufacturing jobs. I believe he has kept his word. He's done what he said. He's a strong leader. Out of my friends, we're all Trump supporters. And we have a couple of friends who were Biden supporters, but they have switched to Trump this year. I think he's a narcissist. I think he's off his, I mean, I really do think he's not all there. We got mixed reaction from locals on the candidates. Matt Alexander says he's not thrilled with either. I talked to a bunch of different uh, different friends and people, and uh, I think that uh, this year, you know, I think that t sometimes we'll say we don't think we have great choices, but this year I think it really exemplifies it this, this election. 15 miles south of Erie, this Biden-Harris sign hangs on Dysa Lindsay's barn. When you come through my small town of Waterford, there's actually a billboard that says Waterford is Trump country in 2020, and that made me feel really um, concerned that we, it's not Trump country. There's lots of Biden supporters in this area. During the month of October, poll after poll has shown Biden with a small lead here, ranging from plus two to plus seven. Pollster Scott Rasmussen tells CBN News Biden needs to turn out the suburban voters of Philadelphia. If he can do that and suppress the state's more rural vote even just a little bit, it could spell victory for Democrats. This is going to be a simple, a simple equation. Uh, do the voters in Philadelphia, do so many people show up to vote and mail in their votes in Philadelphia and the immediate surrounding area to overwhelm the rest of the state? Because this is a state that greatly reflects the urban-rural split in America. Both campaigns see Erie as a must-win county and have made stops here. Hello, Erie. Remember that great victory we had all along. It's good to be back. In Erie. Professor Morris says it could test the Rust Belt's loyalty to Trump. He's keeping a close eye on Erie and Lucerne counties. Demographically, they're very similar. Luzerne is a little bit larger in terms of its population. But I think by understanding what's going on in these two places, we'll have a pretty darn good idea about which way Pennsylvania is going to go. Most polls got it wrong in 2016. But if they're more accurate this time around, that's good news for the Biden campaign here in Blue Collar America, where the race could ultimately be decided. In Erie County, Pennsylvania, Jenna Browder, CBN News. 
Amy Coney Barrett takes her place as America's newest U.S. Supreme Court justice today. The Senate confirmed her by a vote of 52 to 48 last night. Paul Strand brings us this look at her journey to the high court and what lies ahead. A month to the day after President Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Clarence Thomas swore her in at a White House ceremony. Still, her opponents fought to the very end, insisting her confirmation process was rushed and wrong. This Republican majority is ramming this nomination through only because they can. Barrett backers maintain the process followed the Constitution, and the president spoke of Barrett's sacred place in history. Justice Barrett, as you take your oath tonight, the legacy of our ancestors falls to you. The American people put their trust in you and their faith in you as you take up the task of defending our laws, our Constitution, and this country that we all love. I love the Constitution and the democratic republic that it establishes, and I will devote myself to preserving it. After this party line confirmation vote, all eyes will be on the election to see if Democrats take back the Senate and then follow through on threats of consequences like expanding the court with enough liberal justices to undo this conservative majority. Joe Biden told 60 Minutes one of his first acts as president would be appointing a bipartisan commission on the subject. I will uh, ask them to, over uh, 180 days, come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system because it's getting out of whack. The Democrats will, if they take the White House, the House and the Senate, change the rules dramatically and change the country dramatically by expanding the size of the Supreme Court, going from 9 to 11 or 13. And that's just one of the list of horribles that I think they would, they would put into place. Though Barrett didn't face a full-on assault like Brett Kavanaugh, Republican James Lankford blasted the tactics used against his mother of two adopted black children. Even this candidate is being challenged as a racist, quiet segregationist. It is the firebomb thrown into the middle of a dialogue. He said those Democrats probably don't actually believe Barrett is a racist. I have every confidence that the members on the other side would say no, but it plays well to the base. Meanwhile, Senator Josh Hawley celebrated Barrett's confirmation. Tonight, we will set a precedent that people of faith, people of the convictions that Judge Barrett has and shares are welcome in this country in every office. They are welcome on the highest court in the land. Justice Barrett's first case will likely be about Catholic social services getting kicked out of the foster care business with the city of Philadelphia because it refused to back away from the biblical teaching of one man, one woman marriage. The case comes before the court November 4th, a day after the election. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Coming up, the winter weather cools down, the number of coronavirus cases climbing back up. We're going to take a look at what we can expect in the days ahead with our medical reporter, Lori Johnson, when we come back. Stay with us. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep as the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. It's what starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day.
At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. Coronavirus cases rising in the United States and multiple other countries in Europe. Many experts expected the virus to surge again when the weather cooled down, but the death rate remains much lower. Still, the increase in the number of cases is putting a strain on hospitals, with some not having enough space or staff to handle the new patients. With us now to talk more about what we can expect in the days ahead is medical reporter Lori Johnson. So the number of cases climbing we're seeing is it because of testing like the president says or are there other factors well it's actually multi-pronged Ephraim testing is a huge factor can you believe the United States tests over 1 million people per day that's far and away above any other country including countries that have much larger populations than the United States like India for example so obviously when you test that many people so many people are going to test positive and so many of these people are asymptomatic we saw this with Baron Trump and some of the other people associated with President Trump. But there is another factor as well that contributes to these high number of new cases, and that's what we call pandemic fatigue. Remember, people have been doing these mitigation efforts since February and March, and they're tired of it. And now that people are thinking about the holidays and they just want to get out, they're fine. They think maybe I won't get it. You know, the, the death rate is low, so I'm not going to wear the mask. I, you know, more people are venturing out. And we see that people, are, the kids are back to school. The college students are back to school. Young people are getting out again. So there are a lot of different things involved. What can we expect this winter, you think? Well, unfortunately, some of the, the the more reliable models are predicting 300,000 deaths by February. We're at about 225,000 right now. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 75,000 new deaths. So it's very concerning, especially as we enter into the holidays. Like I was talking before about people having coronavirus fatigue as we get close to Thanksgiving and Christmas. These are sacred holidays and the, parents and can't can't believe and can't imagine being separated from their children and grandchildren getting together in a small room it's going to be very difficult to gather around a thanksgiving table wearing masks or gather around the christmas tree and keeping socially distant and so we see the, that this is a very potentially a very dangerous period as we all head indoors and get together mm. for the holidays and the rest of the winter. Um, the numbers can get confusing for people. What about the death rate? Uh, has it gone down since earlier this year? It's plummeted. Not only has it gone down, it's gone down remarkably. And it's, it's so funny because you really don't hear about this very much in the media because it's very encouraging news. Uh, we see that the cases are rising but the death rate, the percentage of people who test positive who actually die from the coronavirus is going down. A couple of new studies show that people who are hospitalized for the coronavirus, the death rate has really gone down from 25% down to 7%. These are people who are hospitalized for coronavirus. And so that's 18 percentage points. That's wonderful news. And uh, largely this is because of the that doctors know how to treat the disease better. Mm -hmm. uh, the White House uh, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows says the administration is focusing on treatments. How soon uh, can we reasonably expect a vaccine and other treatments like therapeutics that the president is often talking about? Well, the president took these wonderful therapeutics. He took three main drugs that attacked three different ways the virus uh, kills people, frankly. And the first one, he took the polyclonal antibody made by Regeneron. That is something that sort of activates the immune system. The other drug he took was an antiviral, which keeps the virus from replicating. Mm -hmm. That's the remdesivir that we hear so much about. And then the third drug 
drug he took, dexamethasone, is a steroid which kind of tamps down that cytokine storm that when, when the immune system overreacts and causes a fatal reaction so many times. Two out of those three drugs are available to the public right now. The polyclonal antibody should receive emergency use authorization within the next few months, but convalescent plasma is very similar to it, and that's available right now to people. Regarding the vaccine, it looks like Pfizer might petition the FDA for emergency use authorization in the third week of November. That is the hint. So it looks like we may have one or two vaccines mm -hmm. by the end of this year or in early January. Mm -hmm. Before we let you go, what do you have coming ahead uh, this evening on Healthy Living? A really great show. I encourage everyone to watch it. I interviewed Christian author Ginny Brandt, and she's a cancer survivor, and she just wrote the book, Unleash Your God-Given Healing. A lot of really interesting information uh, about how to keep yourself well, not just for uh, to prevent or help cure cancer, mm -hmm. but for COVID-19 and all other diseases as well. Mm, very important. Thank you so much. I want to remind you at home that you can catch Healthy Living with Lori Johnson tonight at 930 Eastern, and you can find that on the CBN News Channel. Still ahead, with demonic activity on the rise in America, an investigative journalist talks about the reality of the supernatural realm. We're going to hear from him. That story is coming up next. Stay with us. October 1st, 1961, history was made when a tiny station began transmitting the first signals of the Christian Broadcasting Network. CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. And now, a new era has begun with the all-new CBN News Channel. Just moments ago, the Iron Dome intercepted an incoming rocket right on the Gaza border. And ministering in this area, spiritual warfare is definitely involved. A 24-7 news network, bringing you the news you want from a source you can trust. In Kenya, 40% of the medical services are actually provided by these Christian hospitals. Let's talk about the economy. Believers here are joining together to win people to Jesus Christ. All your favorite shows now in one place. Go to CBNNewsChannel.com to find out how to get the CBN News Channel on your TV all day, every day. CBN News. Life is better with a good night's sleep. Get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover Life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. And welcome back to CBN News Watch. Thousands of witches are plotting a spell against President Donald Trump. CBN News has reported witches have been increasing their political involvement since the president was first elected back in 2016. Now, this comes as witchcraft is on the rise in America. Investigative journalist Billy Hallowell delves into the strange phenomena of supernatural activity in his new book, Playing with Fire, a modern investigation into demons, exorcism, and ghosts. In that book, he explores shocking stories of deliverance through the lens of faith. He tells CBN News is the prayer link. It's a subject the church cannot ignore and must be equipped to handle. Why do you think the world and the church sometimes uh, tends to avoid or even ignore the topic of demons and spiritual warfare? Yeah, I mean, I can't think of a topic that is spoken about 
more in scripture, right? Especially in the New Testament and talked about less in churches. And I think mm. now I, I don't want to say that's every church, right? Because lots of churches do a wonderful job dealing with this and talking about it. But I think we know overall that this is a topic that's avoided. And we did a survey for Playing With Fire where we went out and talked to church leaders. So these were volunteers and pastors. And we asked them, do you believe that demons exist? Of course, the vast majority said yes. Do you believe that demons are impacting culture? The vast majority said absolutely. And then we asked the question, are pastors in churches talking enough about this? And 78% said no. And so it was a really fascinating moment to, again, look at this issue and say, we are not speaking about it. So to answer the question, I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why it's a very difficult topic. It feels strange for people to address. Uh, and I know there are lots of stories I encountered in writing Playing With Fire of people who have gone for help. They've gone to their church and they've said, I have something going on. I can't explain it. And they're not mm. given any assistance or help. Mm. And so that that's a troubling piece of the puzzle. Yeah. That is. really leads me to my next question, Billy. You know, do you think the average pastor feels equipped to take on these issues? You know, I think the average pastor probably feels as though they know a lot about it after reading it. I think there's, for some people, perhaps a disconnect between the real world practice of what you do, right? What it, what goes into deliverance or exorcism or however you want to frame the language and how do you perform that? Again, lots of pastors know how to do it. When we asked the question, there were almost 20% of the churches um, where the leaders we spoke with who said, listen, we have a deliverance ministry at our church, but that's a pretty small percentage. I feel like every pastor should be equipped to deal with this so that people aren't dancing around going to other denominations, going to other places, because realistically, outside of the charismatic world, the only place people really know where to go would be the Catholic Church. They have a very top-down way of handling this. And so I think it's hard to answer because we know our churches are very split, you know, for non-denominational churches. But I would say that if there's an issue that Hollywood is talking more about mm -hmm. than we are, and of course they're not doing it the right way, but they're talking more about it, then that's, that's convicting since it's a very big biblical issue. I get to this question, Billy. You know what's coming, Halloween. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it remains a controversial topic within the church. Do you think it should be celebrated or do you think it's something that may open up people to demonic influence, as you just talked about? Well, I think it's really important to look at what you're talking about here, right? You're, you're, we're talking about witches who are looking at October. This is a time of year where evil is given great focus and where Halloween itself, the, the roots of Halloween are all about trying to knock down the barrier between the living and the dead, right? That's what it was all about. Um, and so you flash forward into the Halloween we have now. I think people have to do what they feel most convicted on. And so for a lot of people, there are a lot of Christians who have alternative Halloween celebrations, right? Churches have harvest festivals, and there's all sorts of other events that go on. In a sense, that's still observing Halloween. It's doing it in a different way. There are families that still trick or treat in their community, but they don't allow their kids to engage in the evils of the holiday when it comes to costumes and other events. And so, you know, I think people have to do what makes them feel comfortable within their faith, pray about it. Um, but I think what we really need to do beyond anything else, because I know this is one of the most controversial questions, right? Halloween um, is that we need to make sure that we are leading with helping our kids understand what Halloween really is and that these are real things. This is, mm -hmm. I mean, the stories that I encountered in writing this book were so stirring and really unbelievable, mm -hmm. even though in my mind I knew all of this was true, obviously as a Christian, really coming around to saying, listen, this is real. You need to avoid these things. You need to not partake in them. And let's find a healthy way, whether that's a harvest festival, whether that's trick-or-treating in a very contained way to observe it and turn it on its head. Don't allow it to be what it what it, the roots of it really are. Make it something else. You can see the entire interview with Billy Hallowell and much more this evening on the prayer link. It begins at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And of course, you can find that on the CBN News Channel. Coming up, the president talking about his faith and how he believes God looked out for him and the First Lady during their recent diagnosis with COVID-19. Stay with us. Hey, if you're tired and exhausted all day, you can't think clearly, and you really just need a cup or even a pot of coffee to get through your day, then join me, Dr. Josh Axe, for this new series where I'm gonna teach you how to transform your diet 
and use essential oils and supplements to get a better night's sleep. Wake up to your best life. Call 1-800-700-7000 to get your free DVD or booklet of Protect Your Sleep today. It's about the competition. I kind of put that pressure on myself and I think people had expectations. It's about overcoming. We use this phrase all the time, keep chopping, keep practicing hard. It's about going the distance. You know, I think as a father, it's my job, you know, to lead, just be the best husband and father I can be. Watch Going the Distance with Sean Brown Saturday night at 7.30 on the CBN News Channel. Orphan's Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We're working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us? Get the top political news and analysis from Washington on Faith Nation tonight at 6 Eastern, only on the CBN News Channel. President Trump says he no longer identifies as a Presbyterian. Instead, he now considers himself a non-denominational Christian. The president revealed his change in a written response to a religious news service. The president and first lady both tested positive for COVID-19 in early October and attributed their speedy recovery to God, saying, quote, I said there were miracles coming down from heaven. I meant it. Melania and I are very thankful to God for looking out for our family and returning us to good health. The president said it's an honor to know multiple evangelists and faith leaders like Franklin Graham and Paula White, who've been influential throughout his presidency. And he emphasized the importance of religious freedom and his support for Christians who have been persecuted. Time now for your Tuesday Tweetable. This is a message I pray will uplift you and you will post tag tweet and share this with those in your circles of influence. Remember this, God's heart for you is filled with love. He sees you and he knows your name. In fact, the scripture says the very hairs on your head, he knows each and every one by number. With that word, I encourage you to make this a terrific Tuesday and be sure to have yourself a wonderful rest of the week and do that on purpose. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. I want to remind you, you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel at any time. You can also find them online at CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. Feel free to email us at the address right there at the bottom of the screen, newswatch at cbn.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us again right here next time. Again, I encourage you to make this a terrific Tuesday and be sure to have a wonderful week on purpose. We'll see you tomorrow.